Now, hi everybody, Physics Ninja. Today what I want to do is I want to calculate the electric field due to two geometries. We're going to consider a uniformly charged uh, ring. And after that, we're going to use the result from the uniformly charged ring in order to construct a disc, right? You can build a disc from a series of rings. So I'm going to show you how you can use one result to calculate the electric field due to the other result. Now, let me just give you a little bit of background. When you first start doing these problems, when you start integrating to calculate the total fields, this could be very, very complicated. It took me a long time to become good at these problems, so don't give up. All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so here's the ring that I'm considering. It has a radius R, and I'm going to consider a point on the axis that is a distance X away um, from the center of the ring. Now, the total charge of that ring, I'm going to call it big Q. That's the total charge if you're going to add them all up. Now, first thing we're going to do is consider a little bit of charge here. I've called that DQ. Here, I've placed it just at the top. Now, the distance from that charge all the way to the point of evaluation is just the length of that hypotenuse, which I can simply write as x squared plus r squared. I'm also going to define this angle here as the angle theta. You can define it anywhere, but I'm just going to pick this one, and that's okay. Now, consider the electric field produced by just this little bit of charge, right? If you know the electric field produced by a positive charge, we know that the electric field should point away from that charge, and I'm going to call that, well, it's going to have a small magnitude, so I'm going to call it DE. Now, it is a vector. It's pointing in this direction. That angle here is also the angle theta. Now, how would you write the magnitude of this vector? Right? Again, I'm just using the formula for a point charge, except now the point charge has a magnitude of DQ. So the value is K DQ divided by the distance squared. The distance squared is this distance but I have to square that value, so that eliminates that square root term. Now this constant k here is simply my one over four pi epsilon zero. Okay, I just kind of like to write it like this, um, kind of a simplified notation. So what do I wanna do now? Well, I wanna find the total electric field, which means you kinda of have to add up all of these vectors. But let's look a little bit at the symmetry of this problem, right? This vector dE, you can break any vector down into components. It's going to have a component like this. I'm going to call this DEX. And it's also going to have a component that is vertical, right? I'm going to call this guy DEY. All right, I want to consider now a little bit of symmetry for this problem. Because we're dealing with a ring, every time there's a charge on one side of the ring, it means there's an equal charge opposite from it. Imagine you were going to look at the electric field now produced by this bottom little bit of charge dq. Again, that there would basically produce a vector with the same magnitude because it is the exact same distance away from the point, and the direction of that vector would be like this. Well, let's think about breaking our vectors down into components again. Any vector, like this top one, can be broken down into two components. I can break this down into a vertical component, and I can break it down into a horizontal component. The horizontal component is going to look exactly like the first one. I'm going to write it over here. Okay, so we're almost done the problem now. So what do we have to do? The first thing we notice is that all of the vertical components, which I'm calling EY here, are going to cancel out because every time there's a charge on one side of the ring, there's an equal and opposite uh, equal charge on the opposite side of the ring. Okay, so the total electric field cannot be, it cannot have any vertical component here. So it has to point along the axis and it has to point away from the ring if it's positively charged. All right, so now let's think about how we would do this. Well, so what we're really interested in here is that our total electric field is only going to have an X component. And what I have to do now is I have to add up or I'm going to have to integrate all of the X components produced by all of these charges when I go around the ring. So each one of those charges produces an X component of the field that's equal to this. It's the vector, the magnitude of that vector multiplied by cos of the angle theta. And you have to integrate all of these to get the total field. Now, uh, we know what the magnitude DE is. I have it written up here. That was my first equation. 
what is this angle theta now? This angle theta is going to be the same for every single charge on the ring. Cos of the angle theta, you can then write, again, just using the uh, trigonometry from this triangle right here, simply equal to uh, x over uh, the hypotenuse. In this case, it's simply uh, x squared plus r squared. All right, we're just about done. Now we're going to go ahead and substitute everything in here. So the tiny x component from one of those charges, you can write as something like this, kdq, x squared plus r squared, that's to the power of one, and then multiplied by cos of the angle theta. Cos of the angle theta is x over, instead of writing a square root, I'm just gonna write it to the one half, which is the same thing. Okay, and at the end, we simply group everything together. So dex is k, let me bring the x on the inside, uh, dq, and now I simply have one term down here is x squared plus r squared. All of that now when I combine both of those is to the three halves. All right, so that's only one little component of de. What I wanna do now is I really want to sum them all. All right, how do I integrate all of these? What I want to do, so this is going to give me the total electric field. Again, the total electric field has to be in that x direction. It has to point away from the ring due to the symmetry. Now let's take out all of the constant terms from this integral. So we have k as a constant term. What about everything else? What about the x? x is the same for every single charge on that ring. You can remove it. Also, everything down here is the same. I can remove it. And what I'm left with is simply integrating over all the charge. Well, this is a very, very simple integral, right? That is simply the total charge of the ring, which I am calling big Q. So at the end, our final result is kx big Q divided by x squared plus r squared to the three halves. Uh, the direction of that field has to be in the x direction. Okay, so that is my result, but how do you know it's correct? Uh, whenever I get a complicated looking result, what I really suggest is now let's take a couple limits to make sure that this result satisfies the physics of the problem. Uh, let's go on the next page. And I'll show you what I mean by that. All right. So some couple special cases we should see if our solution satisfies. First of all, let's consider the center of the ring. Uh, remember where the center of the ring is right here. Uh, if I just draw it in two dimensions here, this is what it would look like. Well, every time you would have a little point charge dq up here, which would produce a field pointing away from it, uh, de, I would have another point charge opposite from it, which would also produce a field de, the same distance, the same magnitude of these fields. At the end, they should cancel out, and the total electric field should be equal to zero when x equals to zero. Well, let's go check our result right here. Right, when x equals to zero, clearly you see that my total electric field is going to be equal to zero because you have kq multiplied by zero divided by r squared to the three halves, which gives me zero. So that there works. All right, what about another limit? What if I move this point really, really far away? If I move it really, really far away, that means that my x should be very, very big compared to the radius of the ring. Now imagine you're standing really, really far away from that ring. What do you think it looks like? When you're far away from a ring, it should look like a point charge. And the field produced by a point charge is something we should know very well. So let's look at this result and let's look what happens when we take this limit here. All right, so we first start just by writing down my expression, uh, e total, uh, kx, q over, x squared plus r squared to the three halves. Okay. Now what happens now if x is much, much bigger than r? What happens to this denominator term? Well, that means I, if I'm adding something small to x, I can basically just ignore that term, right? Because x is going to be so much bigger than this term. And when I square it, right, that difference is also bigger. So what are we left with now? We're left with kx. Doesn't change anything in the numerator but this becomes x squared and everything now is raised to the three halves. And this is approximate. Now, again, you evaluate this, we're left with uh, kxq over x to the cube. Now you see what I can do now, I have x in the numerator and I have x to the cube, which means I can eliminate one of those. And look what I'm left with. 
that my total electric field in the x direction is approximately kq over x squared. That is the field from a point charge. So that also kind of makes sense based on this more complicated result from the ring. All right, let's go now to the next problem. All right, for the second problem I'm going to consider here is a uniformly charged disk. A uniformly charged disk means that this um, it has a uniform charge density, which is the total charge of the disk, which I'm calling Q, divided by the total area of the disk, which is pi big R squared. Now, the result from the ring is listed up here. So how do I construct a disk from a whole series of rings? Well, again, by using symmetry, you should know that the total electric field has to point away from the disk. Because all I'm doing is I'm adding the field from a whole series of rings. And each ring gives me a little bit of field that points away from the ring. So what we first start off with now is instead of being the total field from one ring, I'm going to consider the field from a small element of this disk, okay, which is the field from one ring. But at the end, I'm going to have to add them all up, okay? Um, so how would you write this? Well, again, I would write K, X. Now, again, I'm considering just one ring. The total charge of the disk is big Q. The total charge of one ring, in this case here, I'm going to call this one ring, is going to be DQ, okay? And all of this divided by, again, X squared, now be a little bit careful here. What I'm calling now R is going to be the distance from the center all the way to the radius of that ring. I have to add a whole bunch of rings of different dimensions. So I'm doing something like this, and this is still to the three halves. Okay, now we have to worry about this DQ factor now because each ring has its own charge, right? It has a total amount of charge that's different. If I have a ring on the outside, it's going to have more charge than a ring on the inside, right? Because the charge density is uniform and there's simply more area if I have a ring on the outside compared to a little ring on the inside. All right, so how do we write this elemental charge dq? Okay, so the way I'm going to write it here is going to be that charge density multiplied by the area of a ring, how would you write the area of a ring? Well, I would write it as the circumference of that ring, which is 2 pi little r, multiplied by the thickness. Each ring is going to have a thickness that I'm denoting by dr. All right, so all you have to do now is substitute this into my first expression, and then I'm going to add them all up. So k, uh, kx uh, multiplied now by sigma, 2 pi r dr divided by x squared plus r squared. And this is to the 3 halves. So how do you find the total field? Well, what you have to do now is we have to integrate all of the rings in order to get the total field from a disk. And that means I have to integrate on this side. What is the variable that I'm integrating? In this case, I'm integrating all of these rings I'm integrating over dr. dr goes from 0 all the way to the maximum value of the radius. That's going to be the radius of this disk, big R. So what we're first going to do is let's take out all of the constant terms out of this integral. That'll kind of simplify our expression. So k is a constant. Uh, what about x? x is also a constant, right? It's always the same distance. Take that away. The charge density sigma is a constant, 2 pi, and that's it, right? Everything else now is from 0 to the radius of the disk. I'm left with r dr over x squared plus little r squared to the 3 halves. Okay, so I'm going to go on the next page, and we have to figure out how to do this integral right here, but that's all we have left. That'll give us our expression, at least for the magnitude. We know the direction the field has to point away. Let's go finish this problem on the next page. All right, to evaluate this integral, what we're going to do is do a change of variable. Uh, we're going to define another variable u that is simply going to be equal to x squared plus r squared. That's basically the term down here in the denominator. If I differentiate u uh, with respect to r, I simply get 2r. So that means that if I make a change of variable, you can see that uh, du 
divided by two is equal to R D R. Okay, so that's kind of the change of variable that we're going to consider. So we have this, we have u, and now we also have to modify the limits because we're now going to integrate over du instead of integrating over dr. So how do the limits change? Well, before we had little r go, uh, was equal to zero. That was our lower limit. That means u is going to start at x squared. Uh, my upper limit was when little r was equal to the big R. In this case, u has to have an upper limit of this value. Right? You simply substitute the value inside my definition. So now we go ahead and we substitute everything in here, making our change of variable. All the constant terms are here, kx sigma 2 pi. Now instead of integrating from there, we're integrating x squared all the way to x squared plus r squared. R dr gets replaced with du divided by two. I'm just gonna bring the two in the front here. It's another constant term. And this term down here at the bottom is simply u to the three halves. All right, this is a very straightforward integral, right? There's nothing too complicated about that. Um, so let's go ahead now. I would also maybe cancel out these factors of two. That doesn't help me. Okay, so the last bit now that the radius, or sorry, the field produced by the disk, we have k x sigma pi. And I'm going to do one last step here just so you could see this x squared plus r squared. I always like to write it at to the minus 3 halves du. And then that allows me to simply write it out. I'll just change the order here. I'm trying to go as fast as I can. All right, so the integral here becomes uh, u to the minus 1 half and divided by minus 1 half. And again, evaluated between those limits. Okay, let's substitute everything in here to get our final expression for the disk and make sure that our result makes sense. Okay, we substitute now the limits of the integral. And I have a minus 1 half here um, in the denominator. I'm just going to put a, well, let's just bring it over here for now. We'll fix that in a minute. Um, and everything we're left with here is 1 divided by, this becomes the square root, right, of x squared plus r squared, and then minus 1 over, again, square root of x squared. Okay, how do we simplify this a little bit? Uh, this negative sign, what I'm going to do with it is I'm simply going to distribute it through, so which is simply going to switch the order of both of those, and I'm going to bring the 2 in the numerator, so we get 2 k sigma x pi. Um, all right, I'll switch, switch the order. Uh, this becomes 1 over. Now, if you take the square root of x squared, that is the absolute value of x, and minus 1 over x squared plus r squared. Boy, that's a lot of work to get this expression for the disk. Okay, but that is really the final expression. Remember that the k value here uh, k value is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. This charge density is also defined right there as the total charge of the disk divided by pi r squared. So you could write this formula in different forms. Okay, one thing I want to double check now is what happens if x is very, very small? What if I'm close to the surface of the disk? In that case, the disk looks very, very big. So let's go on the next page and make sure that works out. Last result I want to look at now, what happens when I am close to the surface of the disk? Okay, if I'm close to the surface of the disk, x tends towards zero. Now you have to be a little bit careful. This is the general expression, but you have an x in the numerator here, x in the denominator. Let's have a look at our final expression here. Okay, I'm also going to substitute that constant over 4 pi epsilon zero. I'll leave the charge density the way it is. I'm gonna leave the pi factor here, and let's multiply this through. So what do we have? We have x over uh, absolute value of x, minus x over, again, this term here in the denominator basically just tends toward r squared. Now, if I take that limit of x tending towards zero, this term here goes to zero, right? Because we have a finite number here, and we have zero in the numerator. Forget about that term. This term here, these terms cancel out. Again, I'm gonna be just in front of the disk, x is positive. So this here 
Those cancel out, and that tends toward one. A couple other terms I can cancel out here. I can cancel out a uh, factor of two in the denominator. I can get rid of the factor of pi. Now look what's left, right? My disk, if I'm very, very close to it, the field produced by it is the charge density divided by two epsilon zero. This result should look familiar to you if you know Gauss's law. All right, this is a result that's very, very easily calculated using Gauss's law where we use the symmetry and we use the fact that if you're close to the disk, it appears as though it's basically infinite in size. Okay, so that is kind of a nice check of this more complicated result. All right, thanks for watching, folks. Hopefully you learned uh, how to integrate the ring and the disk in this problem. See you next time.